Lecture 3, The File System. The file system is very important and very useful to programs. Uh, it is much more than just the way of storing data and programs persistently. Uh, it also provides organization for files through a directory structure and maintains metadata related to files. Uh, this is also a good opportunity to demonstrate some of the system calls that we've talked about in the previous topic uh, and also give you some tools with which to actually work with files which will become important uh, as we go through and actually start to work with actual exercises and assignments and examples that really do use files for their data. So the file system is important and it is highly visible. Um, you are quite familiar just as a general user of the computer uh, with how to use files and what they are for and the differences between different kinds of files and the value of organization. Now, having files in different folders and different subdirectories uh, is actually helpful. Now, what is a file? Well, the snarky answer in Unix is everything is a file. And that's not even wrong. The thing about the Unix view of the world is that everything is viewed as a file. So a tool that we're going to use today to learn to read from a file, we could conceivably, you know, in a later context, read from uh, inter-process communication, read from a network. Uh, when we close something, we close a file, it's the same way you would close another type of uh, structure as far as Unix is concerned. Uh, and we can see there are certain advantages to treating everything like a file. If it is a device, it's represented by a file in the file system. And if you want to read from a device, it's no different than reading from a file. And that's something we will, very shortly, know how to do. But for the moment, we'll restrict ourselves to files uh, that are you know, the kind you would normally think about, which is some persistent storage of data. Uh, and any data really is just a series of ones and zeros uh, represented in byte form, uh, and the file is a logical unit to organize it. Uh, if you opened up your computer and you just looked at data on disk, whether it's hard disk or a solid state drive or something like that, it's a sequence of ones and zeros, uh, and making any sense of it is difficult if you don't know what this is, you know, where it begins, where it ends, uh, and so file is an organization tool, uh, and a file is correlated with a particular area of disk, uh, and so we can say that this area belongs to a file, and that's the area where the data is stored. Now files may contain programs, so an executable file, like word.exe, uh, and or data, you know, technical report.doc, uh, and that is a document file. It is data, uh, which is opened by the word.exe executable file. Really, the content of a file is totally arbitrary, uh, and you can see you know, here there is a PDF file, the algorithm design manual. It's a, a book I have been meaning to read for quite some time. Um, but the content is defined by the creator, uh, and the creator is a user. Uh, if the user is using Notepad, or something to that effect. You open it up, you type some text in, and that generates the content of the file, and it's saved. However, more likely, a program is really generating it, uh, and that's a compiler creating an output binary file. Now, files typically have certain attributes, which, although they can vary, tend to include the following things. So a file has a name. This is the symbolic file name, the human readable one. It's the one that, that calls it uh, agreement.pdf. That's a user readable name. There is an identifier, the unique identifier, which, which is usually a number, uh, and that's how the computer thinks about the file internally within the file system. There is some type information, tells us about what kind of file this is. Is it a document? Uh, is it a compiled executable program? Uh, is it a configuration file? We'll find out. Location. The physical location of the file, which usually references what physical device, so what hard drive or USB key or anything else it is on. Size, what is the current size and the possibly maximum size of the file. Protection, this is the access control information, who owns the file, who is allowed to read it, who is allowed to change it. 
Uh, and there's some accounting data as the last item, uh, number seven in the list, time, date, and user ID. Uh, and this is the owner of the file, time of creation, last access, last change. Uh, those kinds of things are useful if you want to figure out, you know, is the file up to date? Who was the last person who changed it? Anything like that. Uh, and files, as we know, are maintained in a structure. This is a, a picture here of the typical Unix directory structure, uh, and they are usually represented as little folders, you know, corresponding to actual file folders that you might put in a filing cabinet. Uh, now, in the Unix uh, structure, uh, the root directory is this little slash here uh, at the top, uh, and underneath there are folders bin, boot, etc., temp, user, home. Uh, and then there can, of course, be subfolders uh, underneath each of those things. So directory structures should be quite familiar to us, uh, and directories really are very much like files. They're information about what files are in what location, uh, and a directory is itself stored on disk. Uh, and if you open up a directory in an editor, it will actually just show you, hey, this is what's in this folder. Uh, and that's really all that there is to it. It's again just a logical organization of other files. Um, so it makes some sense from the perspective of the operating system to think about a file like a struct programmatically. Uh, and a file has certain fields. Uh, a file has some data. These are uh, the fields uh, that we are familiar with, metadata, and there's defined functions for those as well. Now if you want to work with a file, you need the following things. These are mandatory. Uh, other ones are nice to have, but you need to be able to create a file. You need to be able to write data to it and read data from it. Uh, reposition within a file. So when you are reading a file, you might want to skip over a section. You can say, I want to read the first 1,000 bytes and then skip the next 300 and then continue. That would be repositioning where you choose to skip over that stuff. Uh, delete a file and truncate a file. Delete is straightforward. Truncate means the file remains, but you just throw away all its content. So all the metadata remains the same. The file still exists on disk, but the content you just say, uh, I don't need this anymore, uh, and you choose to trash it. So there's a certain um, similarity between file operations and memory operations, right? You have to allocate memory, you have to deallocate memory. That corresponds to create and delete. Uh, read and write, uh, again, we know how to do. Uh, with memory operations, reposition within a file, uh, we're iterating over an array. Uh, truncate doesn't have an exact analog, but that's okay. But we'll look at some brief code examples that demonstrate some of the system calls in the context of very simple programs uh, to make that happen. Now, previously, we looked at uh, reading a file. Uh, and we use the open system call and the close system call. Uh, and uh, if you remember, uh, this operated uh, using a file descriptor, which is an int. Now, uh, the variant that is shown here uses a file pointer, which is a similar but ever so slightly different way of doing the same thing. Uh, file pointers are perhaps a little bit more user friendly. Um, we will become familiar with both of these as we move through the course. Um, but for today, we're going to talk about the file pointer. Uh, and the file pointer is returned as the return value of fopen. If open takes as its arguments the file that you want to open and the mode that you want to open it in. We're going to see uh, about modes uh, shortly, um, but if f is null, something went wrong, we were unable to open the file, and then f close corresponds to f open. So it is required in Unix to open a file before you're going to make use of it. Uh, if you want to read from a file, you have to open it first. If you want to write to a file, you have to uh, open it first. Um, this helps you to uh, actually only uh, work with files that you can actually open right now uh, because somebody else might have previously opened the file or the file might not exist. Uh, and that might stop you from doing the operation. So open is how we actually check and see you know, if we are able to do the operation that we intend to do. Uh, another reason why that might fail is you might not have permissions for that thing. Now, I should point out at this point um, that uh, closing a file is like deallocating memory. You should always do it. There should be a path from opening your file always to closing the file, no matter what happens in your program. 
Uh, and also like deallocating memory, if your program terminates for some reason, let's say crashes, that will automatically close all of the files that it has open. Yeah, it's okay to open the file, leave it open while you're still actively working on it, even if you're not writing to the file for the entire time that you're doing this, uh, and then close it only when you are actually truly done with it, or at least you reasonably believe that you are truly done with it for a while. Uh, repeatedly opening and closing the file is inefficient, it wastes time. So let's actually look at the fopen system call. Um, so all the things uh, under creating, reading, writing, and truncating involve the open call because, as I mentioned, we have to have the file open to do that operation in the first place. And uh, what we specify when we open the file is the mode. Uh, and the mode says, what are our intentions for this file? Do we intend to just read from it? Do we intend to write to it? Uh, are we truncating it? All of that is determined by the, um, all that is determined by our, our choice of mode. Um, and so writing a file you know, requires the file to be open and we have some data to put in there, which we'll actually see, but we have to have opened the file using mode that supports writing. Otherwise we'll be told what we're trying to do is not allowed because we didn't say that we wanted to do that. By that same token, if we as a user do not have the rights to write to a file, trying to open it in write mode will be unsuccessful because we are not allowed. So here are some mode options, uh, and the modes that uh, we will commonly see are R, open the file, read only. W is open the file for writing. Uh, if the file with this name exists, we just overwrite it. Uh, A, open the file and append data at the end of the file. That's why it's A. Uh, R plus is open for read and update. The file must exist. Uh, w plus, create a file and open it for update. Uh, again, if the file exists, it will be overwritten. Uh, and then there is A+, uh, which opens a file for update with new output at the end of the file. So again, append uh, at, the, at the end of the file there. Now, if you add B to uh, the end of whichever mode you've chosen, so for example, you choose RB, um, then that will use binary mode uh, as opposed to just normal text mode. Uh, and as of the C2011 standard, you could also add X, which would make a write operation fail if the file exists. So those uh, additional mode options will help you uh, if you are, say, operating on a binary file uh, as opposed to just a regular text file. Um, repositioning is also sometimes called a seek operation, uh, and in C this is done with the fseek system call, uh, and it adjusts the pointer for reading and writing. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful with this though. Um, so it is possible to reposition to an invalid place. Okay, so seek, as I had mentioned somewhat earlier, is this idea of we want to reposition where we are in the file. So we have read a thousand bytes, uh, and then we want to advance a bit without reading. Uh, then you would use fseek to do that, and you just advance it by, in the previous example, 300 bytes, uh, and go on. That's a little nicer than trying to do a read of those 300 bytes and then just ignoring it. Uh, it's also important to remember that when you read x bytes, that also advances the read pointer by that amount, so you don't have to read a thousand bytes and then call seek. Uh, that, would, uh, that would double the operation that moves the current read pointer, so you don't want that. Uh, but you do have to be careful, because you can go to an arbitrary location, uh, and depending on the encoding of your file, you might have two-byte characters. Uh, there are a, a large number of multi-byte characters, uh, in, in particular in languages other than English. Uh, for example, representing uh, Chinese or Japanese characters, uh, there are multi-byte symbols. Uh, and if you reposition, you say, I want to advance by 31 bytes, that might put you in the middle of a multi-byte character, so it might not do entirely what you expect. Uh, and repositioning is not allowed uh, when you are uh, working with a file that's open for append because you're always just tacking it on to the end uh, and you don't want to, uh, you don't have the option to go back even if you want to. Delete. Just ask the Cybermen about this. 
Um, in C, a file is deleted with the remove function. This very simple example program here deletes whatever file is provided as the second argument. Um, that's not a super realistic use of the delete functionality. It's more likely that you would create a temporary file at some point and then you would use deletion uh, to uh, actually delete that temp file when you're done with it. Uh, and the call for that is remove. It takes a single argument that is the file that you actually want to delete. Now, I should point out that deletion is just kind of a simple version. Uh, it just goes to the file, marks the space as not allocated anymore, and removes it from the directory listing. It doesn't actually get rid of any of the data. It just makes the file system forget the existence of the file. It might still be possible to recover the data if the space it previously occupied has not been overwritten, and that makes it a little bit like a freed pointer in C still being accessible. Some systems do offer more secure deletion routines um, that allow you to overwrite the space uh, or the file to be uh, overwrite the file to be deleted with zeros, uh, and then you can be sure the data is gone. Uh, another thing that's noteworthy in Unix is if you delete a file, whether it's using remove or on the command line or, or using a graphical interface, if that file is open somewhere, the file doesn't go away until the last program that was referencing it has closed that file. So sometimes uh, you will delete a file uh, and the file isn't really and truly gone because it's still open somewhere. Uh, and that is something to watch out for. That's quite different from Windows. In Windows, if you try to delete a file that's currently open somewhere, Windows will tell you, I'm sorry, you can't delete this because it's in use somehow. Okay, now a lot of the operations uh, that we described as basic can be combined for other things that you want. To copy a file, you, know, you create a new file, read from the old file, write it to the new file, all of that is fairly straightforward. Uh, there can also be operations where you uh, read or set various attributes, you know, assign the owner of the file, um, change the access permissions for it, uh, find out what the size on disk is, uh, all of those things. And as I previously mentioned, uh, it, aside from creation and deletion, every operation is restricted to an open file, obviously also accepting open. Uh, when a file is open, the program that called open or fopen gets a reference to it and the operating system keeps track of which files are currently open from which process. Uh, and it is good behavior to deallocate it when you no longer need it. Uh, and when the process terminates, that automatically closes any open files. Some operating systems do support the idea of locks. That's sort of what happens in Windows. If you try to delete a file that's currently open, it is locked by whatever whatever program has it open right now, uh, and therefore you can't delete it. Uh, not every operating system does this. Uh, and locks may be exclusive or non-exclusive. Uh, if you've chosen an exclusive lock, uh, then other processes will be unable to open it. They'll be advised that they failed due to someone having a lock on that file. Similarly, uh, a file that's in use can't be deleted well, it's in use. Uh, and Windows is good like that. It has uh, locking automatically. Any program that has a file open prevents that file from being deleted. Unix does not, so locks are something you have to explicitly ask for if you want them. By default, that does not happen. Uh, in Unix, uh, as long as the program remains open and retains a reference, it can still operate on that file, and it only goes away when its storage space is marked as free when that is closed. However, you can choose, if you wish, to manually lock files. Uh, and the call for this in Linux is flock or flock. I mean, you should think file lock, not as in like flock of seagulls. Uh, and it takes two parameters. It takes the name of the file that you want to lock, or a reference to the file that you want to lock, uh, and then also the type of lock operation that you want to do. 
So if we open a file here, myfile.txt with file pointer here, uh, f open of myfile.txt in read-only mode, uh, and then we have to convert the file pointer to a file descriptor. And file descriptors are of type int, uh, and the function for that is file no. So given a file pointer here uh, to convert it to the file descriptor number, you use file no. Uh, if you just called open uh, directly as opposed to fopen, then it would return a file descriptor directly and you could skip this second line. Uh, and then to lock it, you call flock with the file descriptor uh, and the type of lock that you want to have. This example is an exclusive lock as opposed to a shared one. For now, we will not go into the details about shared locks. Uh, that's something we will consider in more detail later in the course. Uh, but if you wanted that, it would be lock sh for shared as the second parameter. And when we're done, to unlock a file, the second parameter, again, you still call flock, but you call it with lock un to actually unlock it. Okay, but I talked a great deal about reading and writing from files but I didn't show you an actual example of how to do that. Uh, and writing to a file is fairly simple uh, and we should be able to do it easily because it really works very much like printf. Uh, in fact, the function call for it is fprintf and you can also use fprintf to write to the console if you want so there doesn't even have to be that distinction if you prefer. Uh, but the first argument to this is the file pointer where you'd like the data to be written to. So given uh, a point here. Uh, imagine we have an array or a, a linked list of points here where there's a next pointer uh, and a file f. Then while p is not null, f printf f to this file, the one that was specified as a parameter. Uh, and then we have our format string just as we discussed earlier for printf. So percent %d, percent %d, percent %d. We're going to assume that they're all integer types here uh, for our points. Uh, and then the arguments just as we do for printf normally, and then we advance our pointer through our linked list. Okay, that part is um, not very different, as I say, from how we would do printf to the console. The only difference is there's a little f at the beginning here uh, in making it fprintf, uh, and our first argument is the file that you want to write to. If you want to write to uh, the console with this, then you would do fprintf, and instead of a file name, you would specify standard out, stdout, uh, and that would get the job done. Uh, reading from a file involves the use of fscanf, which is the mirror image of fprintf. It does more or less the same thing, uh, just in the opposite direction. Uh, and this is a more complete example because it shows you a whole program here, main, uh, uh, from start to finish. So we declare a file pointer and we have integers i and i squared. We open a file results.dat with f open uh, in read-only mode. If something went wrong, return negative one. Uh, and we will do while f scanf uh, on the file pointer, we have a format specifier uh, and then we have uh, address of our arguments. Uh, and the while condition continues for as long as the return value of f scanf is equal to two. Okay, this is something that happens a fair amount in C. You might like it, you might hate it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it is common C convention and we kind of have to get used to it, which is that sometimes uh, in C, you will find that the condition of a while loop or the condition of an if statement, that is the stuff that's in the parentheses, actually has some effect. It actually does something, it actually changes something. And then you look at the return value to decide whether you do another iteration of the loop or whether this if block is executed. Uh, in some languages, that's not allowed. Um, in, in something like Java, if you want to assign a value, or, you know, it will tell you no, uh, you can't do that uh, because it prevents weird behavior where uh, you said like, oh, if x is assigned to, when actually you meant if x equals equals to. Uh, but this is a pretty good example of one of those cases where it actually does happen. So what happens, of course, is the fscanf function is evaluated. It has a return value. The return value is compared to two. If it's equal, another iteration of the loop will take place. Otherwise, it will not. Uh, and fscanf reads from file pointer, uh, and it tries to read in data uh, and tries to match the format specifier. So it tries to find an 
integer, uh, a comma, and then another integer, and then a new line. Uh, and assuming that everything went well, the first integer is assigned here to i, so we have to pass an address of i because a pointer is expected, uh, and then the second integer that we find is i squared, so if the file contains a 1 and 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, and so on, those will be sequentially assigned to i and i squared, uh, and then we will print the results, so we'll say i is this, comma, i squared is that, uh, and this will continue until the uh, until fscanf does not return 2. Why 2? What's magical about 2? fscanf returns the number of elements that were successfully read. Uh, in this case, we asked it to find two elements, you know, please find me two integers that match this pattern here that includes uh, the two integers, the comma, and the new line. Uh, and if it did, the line we read was valid, everything is fine. We did actually read a value for i, we did read a value for i squared. And that being the case, uh, then the return value is 2, because we read two things. If we got to the end of the file and we called fscanf, then uh, we did not actually read any valid data, and fscanf would return us a different number, probably 0. Uh, because it would say, well, I, I didn't find any numbers, uh, or if you got to a line that was malformed, it would say, I was not able to match this pattern, uh, and we would break out of the loop. Okay. Uh, it is worth noting, actually, that uh, there are a couple of oddities in how fscanf works. Um, like for example, having this percent %d here at the beginning, it skips leading spaces. Uh, or leading white space, so this occasionally leads to some hard to find bugs. Your file has to really truly exactly match the correct format, otherwise you don't get the behavior that you were hoping you would get. Uh, if you are uh, done with the file, which we are at the end here, then we will close it as is polite. Um, now, file types. Okay. Files that we're familiar with have extensions that are separated uh, from the file name by a period, like fork.txt, the dot indicates a separator between the file name uh, and those last few letters, usually three or four of them, uh, represents the file type. Now, these are just you know, a hint. Uh, the txt extension says uh, you should expect that this is a text file uh, and your operating system probably looks at whatever the last segment is and says I'm going to use that information to decide what program opens this. So uh, I'm going to open that in notepad uh, and if it was .docx I would say oh I'm going to open that in word uh, or LibreOffice, whatever it is. Uh, they're hints. You can, if you want, change it so it's you know, fork.xyz, uh, and it doesn't change the content of the file. It does, however, mess up the hint, making it somewhat difficult for the operating system to know what it should open it with, uh, and you might try to open it with the wrong thing. Now, in most operating systems, any program can try to open an arbitrary file. Whether or not it understands what it finds there is a different thing entirely. A .docx extension is a suggestion that it's opened by a word processing program that's compatible with Microsoft Word, but you could try opening it in Vim, and would it work? I don't think so. I think you would see some garbage. I think you would see some gibberish. But you would say, well, that's what happens. So uh, I opened it. The program did its best. Uh, and your operating system frequently allows you to set a default program for the extension where you say I want to associate this extension docx with LibreOffice uh, and that's what happens. Okay. And about directories. So I've mentioned already that directory is really just sort of a symbol table that translates some file names into directory entries. Uh, and it's just an organizational thing by specifying these things are found in this location. So they typically support a few operations like search, add a file, remove a file. Um, those are straightforward. Search, uh, I should double back on and say that um, searching is not necessarily just on the file name, um, but it might also include the content of files as well. If their content is human readable data, that is to say if it's a document of some sort or a text file, you might actually care about searching the contents. Uh, add a file, you know, put a new file in this directory, remove a file, take it out of this directory, list a directory, tell us the contents of this, rename a file, this will change the user-friendly name and maybe it changes how it's organized internally if it's sorted by name. 
And then there is navigate the file system, that is open subdirectories, you know, go to a parent directory, that sort of thing. There exists sometimes um, in textbooks discussions of simple file systems where there's no such thing as a, a folder, there's no such thing as a subdirectory, there's no hierarchy, that's boring and uninteresting and no modern operating system works on that basis uh, similarly textbooks just as a you know, thought exercise will you know every user has their own directory but may not have subdirectories that's kind of silly what we have uh, in basically every operating system is a tree structure there is a root directory and every file in the system has a unique name when the path uh, from the root is combined. So normally when you open a file, uh, if, if I said you know, open in the program earlier myfile.txt, that's a relative name. Um, and if you actually add the current directory to it, you will end up with an absolute path, its unique name. So in Unix, the root directory is just called this forward slash, and from there you can navigate to any file. Uh, and if you want to run the ls command, you will find it in the bin directory, and if you type the full command name, it's slash bin slash ls. Uh, and that's an absolute path if you write it like that. Uh, most of the time you don't have to use the absolute path. For things like slash bin, uh, your shell will by default, if you type ls, then try to prefix it with some basic defaults uh, where it will say oh uh, I'll try slash bin and if it finds the program there it says yep okay that's the one that you wanted uh, and so uh, it generates the absolute path uh, now yeah most of the time you don't have to use the absolute path uh, the relative path from where we currently are will suffice so if I want to compile something with a compiler GCC and it's code slash example dot C uh, then example.c is in a subdirectory of the current directory called code, uh, and the system will work out that we start from the current directory, which for the sake of the example is slash home slash jz slash ece252, uh, and prepend that to the given file name, uh, and so when it actually goes to look for the file that it's going to try to give to the compiler, uh, it will be slash home slash jz slash ece252 slash code slash example dot c. And that one on the bottom there is the absolute path. Now, about deleting a directory. Um, if a directory is not empty, uh, operating system designers kind of have to make a choice about what they want to do. Uh, if it's empty, if you say delete the directory, it just deletes it. If it contains files, the operating system will either refuse to delete it while there exist files in it, uh, or automatically choose to delete all subdirectories and all containing files. So that's probably what you want. Uh, it is a real pain to have to manually delete every single file, so most operating systems are kind enough to, if you are specific and you ask for this, delete all of the files in the directory, even if it's not empty. Uh, and in modern operating systems, the delete command, if you do it in a graphical interface, doesn't actually delete the file or folder, but moves it to some deleted files directory, uh, that is your recycle bin, trash can, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's not really and truly gone. Uh, if it's deleted from there, then it's harder to recover, but if you put it in the trash can, you can always choose to put it back, or if it's in the recycle bin, you can choose to put it back. That doesn't happen if you delete things on the command line, uh, or if you delete things in a program using remove, that really just moves them straight to deletion, so you should watch out for that. If you're used to the idea of when I delete things, I can always take them back out of the trash can later, uh, you have to be a little careful with that when you delete programmatically. So, yeah, uh, Recycle Bin is nice, but uh, it's uh, a modern UI thing and isn't always there for you. Okay, file systems may also support the sharing of files, uh, and this happens when there is uh, one copy of the file, but it has more than one name. In Unix, this is called a link, uh, and it is effectively a pointer to another file. Uh, and links are categorized as either a symlink or a hard link. 
Uh, a sim link or symbolic link is just a reference by a file name. The most analogous concept to this that you should be familiar with is the idea of a shortcut. Uh, if you have a shortcut on your desktop, it is just a reference that says if you go to this directory, uh, you will find this file. So a symbolic link is uh, created to this file, users slash jz slash file dot txt. Uh, and the symbolic link is just a shortcut to that file. If the file is later deleted, the symbolic link is left pointing to nothing, and a future attempt to use that pointer will result in an error. Could an operating system deal with that? Yes, but they don't because it would be expensive to search the whole file system and find all links and remove them, and maybe you don't want that anyway. Symbolic links are frequently used when there are per perhaps multiple versions of a program installed. So if you have, say, um, many uh, Java virtual machines, you could use a symbolic link to say whatever is the latest. Uh, and that way, when you run the command just Java, you don't have to specify which one you want. Uh, it is a symbolic link that points you to whatever is the latest. And if you install a new version of Java, it updates the symbolic link for you. Uh, and it's always pointing to the right location. That sort of thing is convenient. A hard link is creating a pointer to the underlying file in the file system. If a hard link exists and the user deletes the file, the file still remains on disk until the last hard link is removed. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happens in some, uh, some systems by default. It is now the case in Mac OS, for example, using the uh, Apple file system APFS, uh, that if you just copy a file, uh, I, I've got this file here, uh, application.pdf. I copy and paste it into another directory. That actually makes a hard link. Uh, that is, there's still one copy of the file on disk. There's just two references to it in the file system. And if I delete the uh, first one, nothing happens to it. The storage on disk goes away. That's not usually the expected behavior when you copy a file. Usually if I copy a file and it's in this directory and I copy it to another directory on the same disk, I'm expecting there is a second independent copy of that same file. Uh, and you know, this, this isn't always the case now uh, in APFS. But we're going to talk about some details about what it does internally uh, much later on in the course. But the file structure maintains a count of how many hard links reference a file. It's only truly deleted if the count falls to zero. Okay. Files usually also have some permissions associated with them. Uh, so file uh, permissions might be something like read, write, execute, append, delete, and list. Uh, and uh, these are all fairly straightforward uh, as we've discussed already. In Unix, however, uh, we will see that uh, really it's only read, write, and execute that are interesting to talk about. So the Unix style permissions are perhaps very simple, but they get the job done. They're used in Unix or Unix-like systems. Uh, every file is associated with an owner and a group and a set of permissions that can be assigned for that owner. Uh, and uh, another set that can be assigned for the group. And then finally, there is uh, a set of permissions that is assigned to everyone. That is people who are not the owner and who are not in the group that the file belongs to. Uh, and the three basic permissions are read, write, and execute. Uh, so that's really all there is. Read is straightforward. Can I read data from this file? Write, can I write to this file and execute, uh, run it as a program? Uh, and permissions are represented using bits. Uh, 10 of them, one indicates true, zero indicates false. The first bit is zero uh, if it's a regular file and not a directory. It's one if it's a directory. And then the next three bits are read, write, and execute for the owner. The next bits are read, write, and execute for the group. And the last ones uh, are read, write, and execute for everyone. Okay, we're going to uh, take a quick look at this here. Uh, actually, logged into the uh, EC Ubuntu server, uh, and it provides us a little opportunity. Uh, if I just use ls, it lists the contents of the directory, but to actually see the permissions, I'm going to use the uh, ls command with dash al following it, uh, and it shows all kinds of files. Uh, if that's the a, and the l tells us about the permissions that are associated with each of those. So looking up here, uh, immediately here we have a directory uh, in which uh, I as the owner 
uh, because the owner name is uh, this column here, have read, write, and execute permissions. The users group has read and execute permissions, and then everyone has read and execute. Okay, that's the dot directory. It's the current directory. Uh, dot dot goes up a directory. Uh, but if we look at here, uh, this file a dot out, again, I personally, uh, it is not a directory. There's a, a dash here indicating it is not a directory. Uh, as the owner, I have read, write, and execute permissions. You know, uh, the users group has read and execute, and everyone has read and execute. There are lots of other files here uh, that have varying permissions depending on what it is. You can see the uh, cachegrind.out files here uh, are read and write for me only. Everybody else has no access whatsoever. Those are shown as little dashes here. Uh, indicating that that is not the case. Uh, and so this is the human readable format for permissions, uh, and effective permissions are determined by the user. So uh, the, uh, it go the precedence goes from left to right. So if I am the user uh, and I have read and write permissions, that obviously overrides the fact that the group has no permissions, uh, and then everyone else has no permissions, uh, and uh, you can choose whatever is appropriate there. Uh, based on how you assign those permissions and how you assign people to groups as well. The order is always the same. That's why you'll see if you have only read and execute, there's like r x. Uh, the w would go in the middle if it exists, but of course it doesn't, uh, and it's left as a dash, so you don't have to wonder about this. Um, also in this directory here, there is a symbolic link. Uh, which I mentioned earlier, it's got a little L here prefixing it uh, at the beginning. Uh, and uh, the symbolic link actually tells you here newest, uh, and then a little arrow symbol points to search.c. Uh, and if I choose to uh, open, say, newest uh, in Vim, uh, it follows the link and it opens up search.c. Uh, and you'll see that is exactly the same as if I typed search.c directly, uh, although the fact that it ends with .c allows um, the uh, editor to actually take a hint and say, oh, I recognize this is a C program, uh, and I'm going to apply highlighting accordingly. Uh, and so permissions are, uh, are granted using, well, the change permissions uh, tool change mod, uh, and I can uh, do things like, oh, I, I want to you know, add uh, the uh, add the execute permission or my, uh, subtract for minus, take away the execute permission from something. Uh, and we can uh, add write permissions uh, by, add, uh, by adding plus w or minus w, uh, and that works pretty well. Uh, permissions can also be written in octal, that is base 8, uh, and we'll see what that's about as well. Uh, it is equivalent to this uh, RWX kind of notation. Uh, it's perhaps it's just a little bit more compact uh, and maybe a little easier to read. Yeah, so the human readable format, uh, D is used to indicate a directory. L we saw indicates a symbolic link. R for read, W for write, X for execute. Uh, and in the example here, dash rwxr and then rest is dashes, not a directory, not a symbolic link. Owner can read, write, and execute. Other members of the group may read only. Everybody else has no access. And I mentioned that permissions can be written in octal, that is base 8. Uh, and in this, r is assigned a value of 4, w has 2, and x is 1. So you start with 0, and you add the value of the permissions that are present, using 0, obviously, where permissions are absent. So you could say a file has uh, the permissions of 750. Uh, the 7 is, is the first number that corresponds to what the owner has. So the owner has 0 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 equals 7, so they have read, write, and execute. Uh, and then we have uh, the 5 for the group, uh, and this is 0 plus 4 plus 0 plus 1 equals 5, so 4 for read and 1 for execute for a total of 5. Everybody else has no access at all. Uh, and all of the combinations are unique. If you have 1, it means execute only. If you have 2, it's write only. 4 is read only. 5 is read and execute. 6 is read and write. Uh, and 7 is read, write, and execute. So all things are covered with unique numbers. There are, of course, some more details to this. There are things about what do permissions mean on directories. You know, do I have permission to list the contents of the directory? Something like that. Um, there are some advanced topics where you can set user ID and set group ID. 
um, but we are not going to cover those sorts of things uh, in this course. Uh, all you really need to know about is this read, write, and execute sort of thing. Uh, by that same token, the obvious shortcoming of this is that it is very coarse grained. There is not a lot of opportunity to assign very specific permissions. Uh, and another strategy used in SE Linux or security enhanced Linux, as well as Windows NT and its descendant systems, you know, Windows 2000 XP, Vista 7, 10, 8. Sorry, I shouldn't forget about eight. Uh, is uh, an access control list type system. Uh, and the access control list type system is basically that you can assign specific permissions to specific users. So you say user Alice is allowed to read and execute this file. User Bob is allowed to read the file. Uh, and group IT is allowed to execute this file. Something like that. Uh, for the moment, we're going to leave off the discussion of access control lists. Uh, we will be revisiting the topic of file systems when we start to think about file systems and their concurrency somewhat later on in the course. Uh, but for the moment, you should have at least a basic introduction to how does the file system work in a Unix or Unix-like system. Uh, and you should be able to you know, open a file, read data, write data, uh, all of which will be necessary for completing assignments and labs in this course. And to finish out the topic, we'll actually get to see the readfile.c in action. Uh, you will recall uh, from earlier uh, that we looked at uh, readfile.c as an example of how to invoke some system calls, uh, but it's now an opportunity to actually compile it and run it. So here I've got uh, the source code for readfile.c. It should be a close match to what we saw earlier uh, in that we will try to open a file if we specified the wrong name or we didn't uh, provide a valid file name in the first place. The program will exit. Failing that, we will go to this read file uh, function. The read file function declares a buffer uh, size and then allocates a buffer of that size. Uh, we will memset it to clear it, uh, and then we will try to read some data. If bytes read is zero, we'll break out of the loop uh, and we'll print whatever we got in the buffer if there's anything at all. Uh, and then we will print saying end of file, deallocate the buffer, and we're done. Uh, lines 29 and 30 here are one of those opportunities where in a typical C program you might actually see those things combined, uh, where we actually attempt to do the uh, uh, read here uh, inside the if brackets and then comparison to zero. It saves us from allocating here int bytes read. Uh, and uh, in my opinion anyway decreases the legibility of the example. Okay, so I wrote some sample text uh, and it's nothing thrilling. It just says this is some sample text. It's being read from a file and printed to the console. Hello world, goodbye world. Uh, it is not all that big. Uh, it is only about 111 characters. So we should actually pump this up in size a little bit to make it so that we have to do more than one read. Uh, but we can do that, uh, we can do that later uh, once we've verified that it runs correctly the first time. Now, when we want to compile our program, uh, what we will do is we will use GCC. Uh, and uh, GCC will need to be provided with a number of arguments for what we actually want to run. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction that we always use at least the standard of C99. This comes with certain niceties, like I said, about being able to declare an int in the same line as a for loop. Uh, and so we have to specify that when we're compiling with GCC. Otherwise, we will by default get C89 behavior, and that's probably not what you actually wanted. Uh, we can specify uh, any number of additional flags here, including things like debugging symbols, uh, optimization level, all that sort of thing. Uh, if you want debugging symbols that will make it easier to debug your program uh, when you encounter troubles, you do want this minus G option here that adds debugging symbols to the output. Uh, and that will sometimes help you if you are trying to work with the debugger uh, to figure out what went wrong. Uh, and we want to output the file to uh, the executable file to a file name of our choosing. If we leave off the minus O option, I'm just going to call it read file. Uh, if we leave that off, then by default, the executable is generated is called a dot out. Um, okay, that's fine. You'll know where to find it if you need, but we would actually prefer to call it read file. 
uh, like that. And then we have to specify the input file or files that we want to actually provide to the compiler for it to compile. Uh, and we'll do that, and in this case, everything is happy. There are no warnings, there are no errors. The executable file was generated as we expect. So if I want to execute the read file program, dot slash read file, uh, and it will tell me, of course, I failed to specify a file name. And if I specify an invalid file name, uh, then it will tell me unable to open file and it will tell me uh, that's not correct uh, and what I'll actually do is try to read sample text dot txt okay that does match our expectation this is some sample text it is being read from a file and printed to the console as we expect so you know hello world goodbye world all of those things uh, and you know we have end of file we're happy with that uh, we can uh, at some point consider some examples where we actually don't do everything correctly and some bad behavior occurs uh, we can try to figure out how to fix those uh, but for the moment we should be happy with the idea that we were able to successfully read this file uh, and get the output that we were expecting so yeah this read file program uh, does what it promises uh, and it reads the file using a number of different system calls so open uh, and printf even uh, close uh, as well as doing things like malloc uh, and then the corresponding free uh, and uh, also reading the file as we should expect uh, the memset I want to highlight once again is fairly important. We're reading data into the same buffer every single time, and if we don't clean up the buffer before we read the next chunk of data, we might read some trash into the buffer if the file is big enough. Uh, in this case, if our buffer size is you know, 256, uh, it doesn't matter quite so much, but I can easily simulate the idea that the buffer size is really quite small by making the buffer of size 10. Okay. It, is it ridiculously small? Sure. Is that okay? Yep. And we should see the same behavior when we try to read sample text. The only difference now is we read a tiny amount of data into the buffer before reading the next amount of data into the buffer, and so on and so on. Uh, and that turns out, of course, to work as expected because you know, this example has... Uh, has been written in such a way that we always clear the buffer and we read the next chunk, we print the next chunk, we read the next chunk, we print the next chunk, uh, and so our output is exactly as expected. Okay, in our next topic, we are going to look in some more detail about processes, you know, actually running programs in the Unix environment, uh, this introduction to system calls through uh, files, as well as giving you some idea about how to work with files, will be quite valuable in assignments and exercises and labs which you're going to do, but we will definitely be returning to this topic once we have a better handle on the subject of concurrency in general. So thanks, and see you at the next video.